It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. We all experience trauma in one form or another. It may be at the hands of an abuser, a relationship breakup, a health diagnosis, or the death of a loved one. No one is immune. Today's guest, Dr. James Gordon, offers a comprehensive, evidence-based program for reversing the biological and psychological damage resulting from trauma, and he teaches how to learn from and grow through its challenges. Dr. Gordon is a Harvard-educated psychiatrist, former researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health, and chair of the White House Commission on Complementary and Alternative Medicine Policy. He is a clinical professor of psychiatry and family medicine at Georgetown Medical School and is the founder and executive director of the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C. He has traveled the globe to bring help and healing to survivors of wars, mass shootings, and disasters, and he served as an expert for 60 Minutes, Today, Good Morning America, CNN, MSNBC, and PR, among others. He is the author of the book, The Transformation, Discovering Wholeness and Healing After Trauma. Welcome, Dr. Gordon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Joan. It's good to be with you. So, Dr. Gordon, experiencing trauma in one form or another is a part of life, and if you live long enough, it will happen to you. As I said, no one is immune. So, you say that we can use tools of self-awareness and self-care to heal our trauma and become healthier and more whole than we've ever been. Doctor, that's empowering because sometimes when people get knocked down, they tend to stay there and they let their experience become the reality. It becomes who they are and they get stuck in the pain and the loss. And I know this firsthand because nine years ago, within a period of six months, my 23-year marriage ended, my mother and sister died, and my son left for college. And that was, um, it was a gut-wrenching loss. And, and to be honest, quite literally, it drove me to my knees. But the result of that trauma is the work that I'm doing now, which is about changing your attitude, getting your head in the game. So to heal, I became self-aware. I turned the pain around and I used it as a means for self-growth. And I'm a different person today than who I was. So I share that with you because I wanted you to know that I'm an example, everything that this conversation will be about. So let's start off by talking about trauma and its impact on us emotionally and physically, the biology of trauma. What happens in the body when we go through something traumatic? Well, it's uh, listening to you talk about your own experience. I think it's, first of all, important to emphasize that there is potentially this natural process of healing and growth through trauma, Mm -hmm. and that that's available to all of us, to everyone of all ages. So, and your example is such a beautiful one. What happens essentially when we go through a period, and the one you described is very significant losses and pain that comes with them, is there are two basic biological reactions that we have. One is that we go into fight or flight, Uh, even though the threat may be emotional rather than physical. The way our brains and our nervous system work, it's as if there's a predator. Um, And the threat could have been from a loss or disappointment, death, the kinds of things that you describe. But it's as if we're dealing with a predator. And so our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, we put out more blood sugar, big muscles get tense and ready to fight or run away. Parts of our brain responsible for fear and anger start firing more frequently, and parts of our brain that are responsible for decision-making and self-awareness and compassion are not so much in play because it's a life-or-death situation or it feels that way to us. And so that reaction, that fight-or-flight reaction, is natural and potentially life-saving. The 
problem is not with the reaction, but when it persists. And I think you mentioned this, when it goes on and it becomes the ongoing story of our life. When we continue to be fearful, anxious, hypervigilant, easily irritated, not thinking so clearly, tense in our muscles, blood pressure up, blood sugar up. That's what can happen if we don't resolve the trauma that's come to us. And that's what happens very, very often for people here in the United States and all over the world. The other reaction that happens uh, when the trauma is overwhelming and inescapable, when fight or flight won't do you any good because you can't fight and you can't go anywhere. For example, if, uh, if we've been assaulted by people who are exerting overwhelming force, or if we've been raped, or if we're trapped in the middle of a war zone. And sometimes it happens when there's a loss that we can't do anything about either. Is that? And you said something about being brought to your knees, and that's the kind of response you sometimes have. I had that response at one point myself. It just It's called a freeze response, and it's a kind of collapse. And we put out uh, endorphins to kind of protect ourselves against the pain, and we detach ourselves emotionally. We're just too overwhelmed. And the difficulty for us, again, that response can be life-saving. Uh, if you think about a, um, a mouse that your pet cat, catches and the cat grabs I used to have four cats around a cat would catch the mouse in its mouth and shake it from side to side the mouse goes totally limp and sometimes because the mouse is not fighting back and not doing much of anything interesting the cat loses interest puts the mouse down mousy shakes herself off and runs back to her mouse hole so the freeze response is potentially in some instances a life-saving response and if we're overwhelmed by pain, it, it protects us a bit from the pain. But here again, the problem is if the freeze response persists and persists and we become physically tight and tense, shut down emotionally, withdrawn from other people. So one of the ways to look at the effects of trauma are that these two biological reactions are continued traumatic events forward and they become the dominant forces in our lives. And this is what we have to deal with. Doctor, when I went through all of my loss, I did not seek professional help because of my fear that they would initially want to medicate me. I knew that there were very real grief issues at the root of the problem that I needed to work through. And I'm not sure if that was the best approach or not, but it worked for me. A common approach when people seek help is to go to a doctor and oftentimes they see this issue as an emotional problem that's a brain disorder and requires pharmaceuticals as treatment. And, and I want to say, in some cases, drugs are absolutely required. And, and I want to, you know, really drive that point home. But with that said, is it possible that so many people are in need of drug intervention? Aren't we simply masking the root of the problem? I, I think you're, you're correct. It's, uh, it's really more than it is some masking the root, but it's not addressing the root, which is, which is really more important. It's not looking at what's going on. And it's also not respecting the natural reparative capacities that are there in each person. So I would see medication not as a first choice, but as a last resort, because medication has, has a number of side effects that are unpleasant and sometimes somewhat disabling. So the first thing really is to, and the, the program that I describe in the transformation is to begin to deal with these two very powerful ongoing biological reactions, quieting ourselves uh, first, quieting that fight or flight response. So if you simply learn to sit quietly and breathe deeply in the technique uh, that I teach is a kind of non-denominational meditation, soft belly breathing, breathing slowly and deeply in through your nose and out through your mouth with your belly soft and relaxed. If you do that and you're focusing on the breath and you're focusing on the word soft and belly and you're feeling your belly relax, you're quieting the fight or flight response. In fact, you're creating an antidote to the fight or flight response. Blood pressure will go down heart rate will go down, muscles will start to relax, digestion will start to function more efficiently, 
areas of the brain, particularly the amygdala, which is part of the emotional brain responsible for fear and anger, activity will quiet there. And there will be more activity in the frontal part of our cerebral cortex in the areas responsible for judgment and self-awareness and compassion. And it'll be easier to connect with other people because one of the things that happens when we're traumatized and we experience these losses is not only are we in a state of anxiety and agitation and, and worry and tension, but we're also uh, have difficulty reaching out to other people. So simply breathing slowly and deeply on a regular basis, three, five minutes, three, four times a day can make a huge difference. It can reverse the damage that's done by the fight or flight. And there's a good deal of research that's been published on how meditation, this is a kind of concentrative meditation, concentrating on the breath, on the words, soft belly, and on the feeling in your body, that that can not only improve brain functioning in all the areas I mentioned, it can also actually rebuild the brain. We can grow new cells in our frontal cortex and in an important area of the brain, the emotional brain called the hippocampus, which is responsible for some parts of memory and helps to mediate the stress response. So that's the first thing that we should be doing. And so that kind of breathing also begins to balance out the neurotransmitters that, um, that the antidepressants are aimed at increasing. So it, the, it just makes sense. The first rule of our medicine comes from the founder of Western medicine, Hippocrates, which is first do no harm. So why not begin with meditation and see what the result is and only use medication as a last resort? Second technique that I'll mention very briefly is to begin to use approaches that help us to unfreeze, that help us that we need to start moving our bodies. So any kind of movement, any kind of exercise can help us move through trauma. And we know that active aerobic exercise, exercise that burns oxygen, that uh, gets our bodies moving, gets us sweating, that that can definitely raise the very same neurotransmitters that the antidepressant drugs are aimed at raising. Plus, it can also help us release endorphins. So we have the feeling, we feel calmer from the serotonin, and I'm simplifying a bit, we have more energy and more focus from the dopamine that comes from exercise, and we feel more peaceful from the endorphins that are released. So I encourage, as a way of dealing with trauma, moving your body. And there's a tremendous amount of evidence showing the benefits of physical exercise. And then I also suggest that techniques called expressive meditations, like shaking and dancing or fast, deep breathing and, and moving the body that not only give us the benefits of physical exercise, but start to break up those fixed mental and emotional patterns, the fixed patterns of you know going over in your mind how terrible the experience was or blaming yourself for what happened. So these are two ways that, that are really important to begin with to bring us back into balance and to jumpstart the whole healing process and to open us to all the other techniques uh, I'm sure many of which you spontaneously used, and the, the 20 or 25 that I describe in the transformation that can all contribute to our healing from trauma. But we need to put ourselves into balance. Doctor, one of the other techniques that you write about in your book is the importance of imagery to healing. Why does using our imagination help with the healing process? What happens in the brain? Well, what happens when we're feeling traumatized is there are images that we are creating spontaneously that are usually the images of loss, the images of hurt, the images of pain, uh, images of a future that's shadowed by the past. And so what we do is very simply create images that are an alternative, uh, if you will, a, a different narrative. Images have enormous power, physiological power. So for example, if I imagine that I'm seeing you, the same areas of my brain are activated uh, as would be if I were actually in the room looking at you. Mm -hmm. And similarly, if I imagine that I'm hearing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the same areas of my brain are going to be activated as I imagine those chords. So one of the very simple uses of making use of this 
a blessing that our brain gives us, the, the sort of the power of our imagination, is to uh, sit quietly for a few minutes and to imagine that you're in a safe place. And I've seen this be so calming and so soothing to people, even in the middle of wars. They imagine for five, ten minutes that they're somewhere else or that the war is over and they're sitting in their house peacefully. And there are major positive benefits, physiological benefits that come from using this imagery. We can also use imagery in more, even more targeted ways to decrease pain, improve immune functioning, decrease anxiety, help us with performance. All of those uses, imagery is an enormously powerful tool. And I also uh, teach not only how to use the safe place imagery, but how to use imagery to solve the challenges and problems that come up in our lives by imagining going to that safe place and imagining that in that safe place, we meet a wise guide, which is a representation of, call it what you want, our imagination, our intuition, our unconscious. In some cultures, they believe it's a representative from the spirit world. However you want to conceive of this wise guide, who could be a person, could be a wise old woman or a wise old man or a child, could be an animal, could be a scene uh, from nature. If you have a dialogue with that guide, and I know this may seem improbable to some of the people who are listening, but what's amazing is almost always that dialogue will yield answers. All you have to do is say to whatever guide appears and take whatever guide first appears to you, what should I do about X, Y, or Z? And a dialogue will start to unfold. And it's a dialogue between our conscious mind and that part of our mind that has not yet come into consciousness, the imaginative, intuitive, unconscious part of our mind. And answers come up that don't come to our rational mind. And especially when we're in a state of anxiety after we've experienced a loss or other kinds of trauma, we're just going over the same things over and over again. And maybe we're making lists and we're evaluating everything. But this brings answers from a whole other region of this great brain that we have that's there to to serve us and heal us. And Doctor, what's so wonderful about what you're saying and, and what you write about in the body of your work is that you're teaching us just how powerful we are. Because as I said, when you go through these types of experiences, you tend to feel like a victim, that you're helpless, and, and really nothing can be further from the truth. Exactly. That's beautifully said. Because each of these techniques, and as I said, I teach there may be 20, 25 different techniques, each has its own benefits, and all of them are grounded in the reality that we have the power to make change, that, that's, that we have a control that we have forgotten that we have. And each one reminds us that we can make a difference in how we feel. And as you say, one of the worst things after we've suffered a trauma of any kind is we feel helpless and hopeless. And doing any of these techniques, aside from the specific benefits, gives us that message. You can help yourself, and it's not hopeless. The possibility is there for all of us, and we don't realize it. And I, I don't emphasize this, and you said it so well, was also that we do feel like we can't do anything. And it, once we start seeing that we can do something to change how we feel, we may not be able to bring back the lost one or stop the violence in our community but we can do something about ourselves and how we feel. One of the things I did, doctor, that really helped was I started to write in a gratitude journal. I got tired of feeling so sad about everything. So I said that every night before I would go to sleep, I would write down a few things for which I was grateful. And my plan was to write five things. And to be honest, when I started, I didn't even think I could come up with five things. But surprisingly, before long, I would start writing and, and I would write and write and write. And all of these things for which I was grateful for would just pour out of me. And I did this every night because I wanted it to be the last thing that my brain focused on before I went to sleep. Is this a good practice? Is an attitude of gratitude helpful in the healing process? Uh, I think it's wonderful. And I, I love what you're saying about doing doing it the last thing in the evening. So it's what you fall asleep with this 
uh, with this feeling of gratitude and with very specific examples. There's been a lot of research done on uh, people who keep gratitude journals. And whether it's three things or five things, or if you decide to write in your journal in the morning rather than the evening, it works. It helps to decrease symptoms of physical illness, it improves mood, decreases levels of anxiety. It's a very powerful form of medicine, and it's beautiful that you found it for yourself. And I, I recommend it to, uh, to everybody to experiment with. And, I, and again, like, like you, uh, there are many, many people who've also experienced those, those kinds of benefits. Because what it's doing is uh, you're reaffirming your investment in the world. Yes, something terrible may have happened, but there are also things that are going on in your life that, that really do give you pleasure, that do um, make you glad to be alive. And the gratitude journal, uh, it's good to think about those things and even better to write them down because that gives them even more reality. And doctor, even if someone chooses to go the medication route, can your science-based techniques still be implemented and, and what type of an impact could that have? So if, if you do go on medication, Again, once again, become aware of what are the benefits, as you would with any technique. What are the benefits? What are the downside? And that's something that you have to judge for yourself. And you can use all of these techniques. Many of the people I've worked with and many of the people I describe in the transformation, at least in the beginning of their working with me, they were on medication. And many of them, over time, were able to go off the medication or lower the dose. One thing you do have to be aware of, though, is that if you start doing some of these techniques, even doing quiet meditation like soft belly breathing, you may need less medication, that the amount of medication that you've been prescribed that was working well for you may be too much because the medication was prescribed to uh, improve neurotransmitters or decrease anxiety, you're, and you're on your using these techniques, the ones that are in the transformation, you're already improving the levels of neurotransmitters. You're already decreasing anxiety. So you have to be careful about the dose and consult your physician about that. And the same, I would add, is also true if you're on medication for high blood pressure or uh, type 2 diabetes or pain medication or for some medication for sleep. Uh, you may not need as much as you did uh, when you began to use these techniques. So just check in with your doctor and let, let your doctor know what you're doing because it's important and it, and it does work on your physiology. Dr. Gordon, to sum it up, what would you like to leave our listeners with regarding the power that we have within to heal? Well, I think the first thing is what you said in the beginning is that the trauma, which is a Greek word that means injury, is going to come to all of us sooner or later in our lives. And that we all have the capacity to create programs of trauma healing and not only to heal from the trauma and to bring ourselves back into physiological and psychological and social balance connection with other people. But we also, as we begin to use this uh, approach that I, that I describe in detail in the transformation, we become open to whole other possibilities, possibilities of ways to find fulfillment that we might never even have imagined before we experience the trauma. This is a very uh, ancient understanding. All of, uh, all of the great religions understand this. All Aboriginal people that I know of around the planet understand this. The trauma, as painful as it is, is also the soil in which we grow and in which wisdom grows and in which change can happen. And, and you describe that so beautifully in, in your own life. So I, I think everybody needs to understand both sides of it. The trauma is going to come sooner or later, that we can meet the challenge that each of us can do that no matter what our age is or our uh, socioeconomic status and that we can grow as we meet the challenge that trauma brings us. The book is The Transformation, Discovering Wholeness and Healing After Trauma. If you would like to get more information about Dr. Gordon and his work, you can visit jamesgordonmd.com. Dr. Gordon, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your evidence-based program for reversing the biological and psychological damage that results from trauma. 
You offer hope that we can learn from and grow through its challenges. So thank you for spending time with us. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much, Joan. I've enjoyed it myself. This is Conversations with Joan. Stay with us. We'll be right back.